We hear the word endangered all the time, like, save the endangered so-and-so. It sounds like a word that people just throw around. But there are thousands of experts that have set standards on exactly what endangered means and how it can be used. And let me tell you up front, I was surprised at how meaningful endangered is. Let's work our way through the five criteria that says whether a plant or animal is endangered. If any one of these five criteria is true, then we're talking about an endangered species. So first off, we have criteria A, population size reduction. This is a population reduction measured over the longer of 10 years or three generations based on any of A1 to A4. For A1, this is a population reduction observed, estimated, inferred, or suspected in the past where the causes of the reduction are clearly reversible and understood and have ceased. A really good example of where A1 could have applied to a population would be the passenger pigeon. At the time, it was probably the most abundant bird in the entire world. But then the passenger pigeon was extensively hunted. There was also habitat loss as a factor in its decline. But if people had all gotten together and said, you know what, we need to stop hunting the passenger pigeon, its numbers are really declining, that means the population did experience a steep decline, but the reasons for its decline, they're understood, they're reversible, and they have stopped. In that case, the population could have been listed under criteria A1, assuming that they had stopped hunting the species at either 50% decline, 70% decline, or 90% decline. And that would have given it vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered status. Then there's a two, population reduction observed, estimated, inferred, or suspected in the past where the causes of reduction may not have ceased, or may not be understood, or may not be reversible. So you can see the standards are a little bit stricter when the population decline has a known reason, but that reason has stopped. For example, if the passenger pigeon had a 90% decline, but then everybody stopped hunting it, it would be critically endangered. But if the reason for the decline is not fully understood, or if it's still in place, then they would become critically endangered at an 80% decline, under A2. A3 refers to the future. It's a population reduction projected, inferred, or suspected to be met in the future up to a maximum of 100 years. The logic for all the A criteria is that if the species is on a rapid decline, it doesn't matter how many are left because they're going to go away soon. So all of the thresholds are percentage thresholds because if you've lost 80 or 90% of your population in the last three generations or 10 years, that population is in serious risk of just disappearing entirely. A4 an observed, estimated, inferred, projected, or suspected population reduction where the time period must include both the past and the future up to a max of 100 years in the future, and where the cases of reduction may not have ceased or may not be understood or may not be reversible. So this could be used in a case where the population is in decline but hasn't quite met the thresholds for either A1 or A2 yet. Any of the A criteria can be based on either direct observation, an index of abundance appropriate to the taxon, a decline in area of occupancy, extent of occurrence, and or habitat quality, actual or potential levels of exploitation, and effects of introduced taxa, hybridization, pathogens, pollutants, competitors, or parasites. An example of a species that's classified endangered under criteria A are tigers. Tigers are classified under criteria A2. Their population has declined significantly. The reasons for their decline, like habitat loss or hunting, may not have ceased or may not be reversible, and it's possible that we don't even understand all of the reasons for their decline. The things used to support their classification under A2, they used A, B, C, and D. Criteria B is much more interested in the geographic area that the species has to live in. Living in a small geographic area isn't necessarily a problem for species, but if it's combined with other factors like a fluctuating population or a decline in population, it can be a serious risk factor for extinction 
because the species has no backup population. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So criteria B looks at extent of occurrence or area of occupancy and additional criteria saying that the population is vulnerable to being extinct. If both of those are met, then they can list under criteria B. Extent of occurrence is defined as the area contained within the shortest contiguous imaginary boundary which can be drawn to encompass all the known, inferred, or projected sites of present occurrence of a taxon, excluding cases of vagrancy. Basically, if you were to draw a line on a map of every place that you could find every living individual of this species, except for ones that are way outside of their normal range, how big would that line be? On the other hand, area of occupancy refers to the area of suitable habitat currently occupied by the taxon. For example, if the extent of occurrence was very large, but inside of that boundary they only live on, like, cliff faces, a small area of occurrence represents an extinction risk because they only live on very tiny, specialized habitats, even though their extent of occurrence may be larger, they don't live in that entire range. If the extent of occurrence of a species is under 100 square kilometers, then that species is critically endangered. And if you think of a species that only lives in 100 square kilometers, if there's a natural disaster, if the population fluctuates too low, then that population can go into a tailspin from which it can never recover. So if a species did exist in less than 100 square kilometers, and at least two of the following three conditions were true, A. Severely fragmented or number of locations equals 1. Or if there's a continuing decline observed, estimated, inferred, or projected in any of extent of occurrence, area of occupancy, area, extent, and or quality of habitat, number of locations or subpopulations, or number of mature individuals. If any of those were declining, then this would trigger or C, extreme fluctuations in any of extent of occurrence, area of occupancy, number of locations or subpopulations, or number of mature individuals. If there's extreme fluctuations up or down, then that species is more at risk of extinction because if the population dips down too low, there's a feature called an extinction vortex that can kick in where a very small population gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it just goes extinct. An example of a species that was listed under criteria B is the Floriana Mockingbird, and it was listed under B1, with A and C being true. Specifically C4, the number of mature individuals was fluctuating. And then B2 also applied with A and C4, so their extent of occurrence and their area of occupancy was within the parameters to be listed as endangered for B1 and B2, based on A and C4 also being true. Criteria C is used to identify organisms that have a small population size and are also declining. So, for example, if the number of mature individuals is less than 2,500, and at least one of C1 or C2 is true, then a species could be considered endangered. I think this criteria is pretty self-explanatory. If the population is small and it's declining, that's a major risk for extinction. So number of mature individuals, if it's under 250, then it's critically endangered. If it's under 2,500, then it's endangered. And if it's under 10,000, then it's vulnerable. Assuming that at least one of C1 or C2 is true. C1 is an observed, estimated, or projected continuing decline of at least, for example, 25% in three years or one generation, whichever is longer. If they're under 250 individuals and they're going to decline at least 25% in the next three years, you can see things are really critical. They're critically endangered. Or C2, an observed, estimated, projected, or inferred continuing decline, and at least one of the three following conditions. So we're in another subcondition. The number of mature individuals in each subpopulation is less than or equal to 50, or the percent of mature individuals in one subpopulation is 90 to 100 percent. So this is saying the population is low and the subpopulations are separate from each other. That's a problem. Or, if they're all in one subpopulation, 
that's also really a problem because one big event could affect the entire species at the same time. Or, C2b, there are extreme fluctuations in the number of mature individuals going up or down. If that random movement happens to go too low, again, the species might just go into a tailspin and not be able to recover. I think it's helpful for this one to talk about a specific example. So the Malay tapir is endangered, and it is listed under A2 and A3, which we talked about earlier, but then it's also listed under criteria C1. Because it's endangered, we know that there are less than 2,500 of them left in the entire world, and C1 says the population is projected to fall an additional 20% in five years or two generations, whichever is longer. So for tapirs, that would be two generations. Their population, even though it's at under 2,500, it's projected to fall an additional 20% over the next two generations. I'm really hoping what this is conveying is that when people say endangered or critically endangered, things are much worse than they sound. Like 250 individuals left in the entire world or projected population of 20% from an already small population. And speaking of small populations, let's hop into criteria D, which is entirely about very small or restricted populations. Like, just look at criteria D. The number of mature individuals for critically endangered, less than 50. Or for endangered, less than 250. One species that was categorized under criteria D is the bottle palm. It's a beautiful-looking palm tree. It's common in horticulture because it is so beautiful, but its native range is one tiny island of just 0.65 square miles. It was listed under criteria D because there are less than 10 individuals left in their native range. I've been fortunate enough to see a bottle palm in a horticulture setting, and they are beautiful. But their tiny population in the wild really suggests problems for their future existence. And then D2 only applies if you're in the vulnerable category. This says that the restricted area of occupancy or number of locations with a plausible future threat that could drive the taxon to critically endangered or extinct in a very short time. I couldn't find an example of a species actually listed under D2, but let's just propose a hypothetical species for clarity. This species has a range on a volcanic island. There are less than a thousand individuals left, all living on the sides of this volcano, and their area of occupancy is less than 20 kilometers squared, or less than or equal to five locations where they can be found on the sides of this volcano. There is a plausible future threat that that volcano erupting at some point in the future could reduce the population from less than a thousand all the way down to less than 50 or completely extinct in the future. So that species would be listed under criteria D2. Another example of a species that was listed under criteria D was the Kaki. There are only 143 individuals left, and it's already estimated that they would be extinct in the wild if there was not a breed and release program already in place. So that's an example of a species where they were listed as critically endangered, but then people stepped in and started to help save the species, and they have succeeded so far. Finally, we jump down and we have our quantitative analysis. If the quantitative analysis suggests that there is a 50% or greater probability that the species will go extinct in 10 years or three generations, whichever is longer, then that population would be listed as critically endangered. I searched for a while. I could not find a single species assessed under criteria E. I did find this orchid, though. And this orchid probably has the most reasons for being critically endangered out of any species in the world. It's called Ellen's Paphiopedilium. I think this population will help us to review everything that we've learned today. Ellen's Paphiopedilium is listed as critically endangered under A2, the population reduction observed, estimated, inferred, suspected, where the causes of reduction may not have ceased or may not be understood or may not be reversible and A3, population reduction projected, inferred, or suspected to be met in the future up to a maximum of 100 years, 
and a four an observed estimated inferred projected or suspected population reduction where the time period must include both the past and the future where the causes of reduction may not have ceased or may not be understood or may not be reversible so pretty much the ones you don't want to get out of a because a1 says that the causes have stopped it's also listed under b1 and b2 with a and b both being true so it has a low extent of occurrence and it has a small area of occupancy within that extent of occurrence. It's also listed under C1 and C2, so there are less than 250 mature individuals left, and they have a continued projected decline of at least 25% in three years or one generation, whichever is longer, and C2A1 is true, which means that they're split up into subpopulations of less than or equal to 50 individuals each. And it's also listed under criteria D. The number of mature individuals is less than 50. So Ellen's paphiodelium has experienced population size reduction. It has a small geographic range. It has a small population size broken into tiny subpopulations. And it has a very small or restricted population with less than 50 individuals left in the wild. So when we say the word endangered, we're saying that one or more of these things are true. We might be saying that the population has declined by 50% over three generations. And that's an alarming situation. If an animal is critically endangered C1, then there are less than 250 individuals left in the world, and they're still declining at a rapid rate. So if you hear the word endangered, you need to hear that the plane is on fire. It's emergency time. If you hear critically endangered, you need to hear that the plane is on fire and about to crash into a mountain. If nothing changes, this species is going to die. Remember that, but also remember that the alarm has been sounded. We know the future if nothing changes, but what if we change something? What if we find a species that's on the path to extinction and we nudge it back to a stable course. That's an action that we can take in our lifetimes that will matter far into the future. Please use the comments to let other people know about a species that you care about. You can support this work on Patreon or as a channel member, and you can subscribe to keep increasing your knowledge. Thanks for stopping by to learn what makes life awesome.